Thanks, Joel. Wasn't that good? I hope you're already encouraged in the Lord. You know, what we do on Sunday morning is we battle with you, I hope, in the power of the Holy Spirit, in light of the Word of God. We battle with you to help you get the right story defining your life. That's what we're doing, right? Because every week we hear all kinds of narratives that come into our lives, false narratives, especially as Christians as we're seeking to live holy in godly lives. And we come in tarnished and broken, discouraged by the battle that we're in. And as we come in on a Sunday morning, a lot of us are, have, have lost our orientation around the gospel. And so we sing over you and we read over you and we, we pray over you together. We pray to remind each other that there is one story that defines the church of the living God and it's the story of a savior who has come and died and risen from the dead and reigning on high and all the nations will come to him. Isn't that our defining story? Don't you and I need to be reminded regularly who we are and who we have and why we're here? That's what we're doing this morning. It's about the gospel. We're here to remind each other. And in Luke chapter 3, what I want you to see is that Luke in this gospel is not just haphazardly telling us details about the early stages or the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Luke is showing us that this baptism of Jesus, this ministry of John the Baptist, this launching of Jesus into his mission is by the set purpose and plan of God. It is the culmination of the preparation of God down through the ages. This is scripture being fulfilled before our eyes. And you and I need to come at this for one simple reason. Luke is writing this gospel because God is going on mission to the nations through his church. That's why he writes Luke. That's why he writes Acts. God is on the move. Aslan is on the move. God is going to the nations. And guess who's going? You and I. And it's a battle, right? It's war. And we are hearing the enemy's lies and we are bombarded with the world's news, and you and I need to be reminded week after week after week, we serve a risen, triumphant king who has won the nations and will win the nations through his people. So we're the stone in David's sling that he's launching. He is sending us out into the world to bring the hope of the gospel. And so this is what I want you to see this morning, that we need... Every week, we need in the gospel to hear the true story against all the false stories that shape our lives. So let me read you a quote from Kevin Van Hooser. He writes this, One important way theology, and he means biblical theology, one way theology helps church leaders to make disciples is by better enabling them to critically examine the images and stories by which Christians live in light of the images and stories by which they ought to live. Got that? You and I are living our lives according to stories that are not true stories. And we need to be reminded of the true story that shapes every Christian's life in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what theology does. We go through the scriptures and realize God has been flashing neon lights all the way through the scriptures, saying, I am coming, I am king, I am Christ, and I will redeem. Isn't that great news? And regularly, he pulls that together here in Luke chapter 3. Regularly it comes, and then here we get to see that. Let me just ask you the question before we study this text at all. What has been the narrative of your life this week? What's the story... Uh, that has been defining you this morning. Can you just think about that for this morning? If you were anxious this week, what's the narrative? What are you hearing? What are you being tempted to believe that is feeding your anxiety? If you have been frustrated all week, what's the story that's been fed into your mind that tells you Something different than the story that you need to hear today. 
you understand what's being said here? We need the Bible because the Bible tells us the truth. We need the word of God so we can see the way of God and the will of God and the work of God when sometimes, John said it at the beginning, sometimes we come into worship and it is foggy as anything. Has it been foggy for you this week? Has it been difficult? Let me uh, read to you another uh, quote here. This is from J.R.R. Tolkien. And Tolkien, Lord of the Rings fame, used this truth to talk to C.S. Lewis, which led C.S. Lewis not to become a Christian, he eventually did, but to become a theist from atheism. And this was actually uh, what affected Lewis. It wasn't written to Lewis, this one. This was in his letters to Christopher. But this is what Tolkien wrote. He says, of course, I do not mean that the Gospels tell only what is only a fairy story, but I do mean very strongly that they do tell a fairy story the greatest. Now stop there, just so you don't get thrown off by what he's saying there. He's not saying that the gospel is a fairy story. What he's saying is it's like a fairy story, only it's real. It's a glorious story. (laughs) And it makes all the other stories pale in comparison. And so this is what he says. Man, the storyteller, would have to be redeemed in a manner consonant with God's nature by a moving story. But since the author of it is the supreme artist and the author of reality, this one was also made to be true on the primary plane. God is the supreme author and he, or the artist, and he's the author of reality. And so he has created not a philosophy, uh, not a religious uh, story of fantasy, He has created living history by which he comes and redeems a people for himself. Isn't that good news? That's the story of the gospel. And you know, you and I have to realize as we read um, the gospel of Luke and we read the book of Acts, Christians have had to battle to keep the story straight. I want to tell you that this morning. If you came here and the battle was not straight in your head, you've been anxious, angry, fearful, frustrated, all of those things, whatever's been going on because you've got your story from somewhere other than God's story, let me just remind you that that happens to God's people all the way through the Bible. Jeremiah, remember Jeremiah? He writes the book of Lamentations. He's called to speak prophecies and they don't listen to him. They actually throw him into a pit and imprison him and reject him. And in Lamentations chapter 3, he describes what it was like for him. Basically, he's saying, God, you did this and you did this. He's not looking at anybody else. He believes in the purpose of God. And then he says, I got to the point where I almost didn't have any hope, no hope. And then he says, but this, what? I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. You know what it is? The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new, how often? Every morning, because great is thy faithfulness. Isn't that good news? What is he doing? He's taking the word of God and he's applying it. Listen to Kevin DeYoung. He says, if you ever think to yourself, I need to know what's true. What's true about me? What's true about people? What's true about the world? What's true about the future? What's true about the past? What's true about the good life? America, you need to get that one right. And true about God. Then come to God's word. It teaches only what is true. Jesus says this, sanctify them in the, your word is truth. Oh, friends, Sunday morning, we're getting the story straight. Again, right? We're getting the gospel straight again so that we can not just get our heads on straight and our hearts on straight, but we can get our feet on straight for the mission of the gospel because there's a world listening to a world world of lies. There is no hope. There is no joy. There is no peace. And we say, oh, yes, there is. And he came in Luke chapter 3. He comes here. So let's, let's look at this text of Scripture. And the way I want you to see this is as Luke is not just casually writing, he's pulling together in the life of Jesus all the prophecies 
that have gone before, let me show you three main stories that he is showing to us. First of all, in the first two verses, which um, Joel adventured and did very well, wherever you are, Joel. Uh, you know, when, when you get, <laughs> there you are, brother. When you read those first two verses, you're going, why in the world did I volunteer to read scripture on Sunday morning? All the names of the kings and the priests. But this is the story of cruel kings and corrupt priests. That's what he does. It, he begins Luke chapter 3 with what was true of the people of God since the fall of Adam, since the time of Samuel and David. All the way through Israel's history, we have this record of cruel kings and corrupt priests. And then we have the story after that of impotent prophets and insolent people. And so we have John the Baptist coming in as the last great prophet. Jesus says, John the Baptist is the greatest of all the prophets, but he's still frustrated. He who is least in the kingdom is greater than he, right? There is something going on here. So here is John representing prophets who have been dissed, dismissed, rejected because people are stubborn and rebellious and stiff-necked. That's the history of Israel. And then we have the story, the great story, the true story, the Aslan story, the story of a powerful prophet, a faithful prophet, perfect priest and a kind king aren't you glad for the climax of this story when we get to the baptism of Jesus so let's let's look at this text together and walk our way through it let's start out with the story of cruel kings and corrupt priests Michael Card says this into a world dominated by fear injustice and, oh sorry into a world dominated by fear injustice and corrupt power steps the prince of peace and the light of the world. That's what's going on here. In this world, so in the, in the beginning of this text, we actually have three groups. We have what's been true all the way through the history of Israel. We have kings, we have priests, and we'll get to John, we have prophets. And so we begin in the first two verses with this statement by uh, Luke. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, And so I want to set it up for you in the sense the dating of this is probably somewhere around 29 A.D. Because uh, Tiberius Caesar was made uh, Caesar, the Roman emperor, in 14 or 15, 15 A.D. And so we have in this text of Scripture that it was, uh, sorry, in 14 A.D., because it's the 15th year of his reign that Jesus comes. Now, if you look down at verse 23, how old is Jesus? He's 30 years of age. And so we have Jesus at this point in time. Tiberius is the ruler, and I tell you, the emperor was not kind. Who is the governor of Judea? Verse 1. Pontius Pilate. Anybody heard that name before? You know who Pontius Pilate is, right? He is the governor of Judea who works with Herod and is persuaded by the religious leaders to give Jesus up to Calvary, to the cross, to be crucified, even though he said, I find no guilt in him. Amazing, right? This is corruption. At every level. Look at what it says. Who else is on the scene at this? Pontius Pilate, governor of Judea. Herod being tetrarch of Galilee. His brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Ituria and Trachonitis. And Licinius, tetrarch of Abilene. Herod the Great is gone. And his reign, his region has now been parceled out to family members. And I'll tell you this. The family members did not get along very well. For example... Later on in this text, why is John the Baptist thrown into prison by Herod the Tetrarch? Because as a prophet, he comes and tells them, you better get straight because the Lord is coming. You better get your act together. And he tells Herod, you have your brother's wife. And he calls them to repentance. Do they like it? No. No. And so we're told that also alongside with these political corrupt uh, uh, leaders 
is also the priest. Notice what it says in verse 2. During what? During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Now, I, anybody um, reading this in, in the history would realize there's something fundamentally wrong with that sentence. What's wrong with the sentence? Well, there isn't two high priests. There's only one. But do these men, these priests, show up later? They absolutely do. They show up at the time in the trial of Jesus, on the night he's betrayed. Where do they take Jesus? They take him to Annas's, the high priest. But Annas is not supposed to be the high priest because Gratus has evicted him from the role of high priest before um, uh, when he was governor, he's evicted him, and so now he is not supposed to be the high priest, but guess who's acting like the high priest? You see, Annas and Caiaphas are working together, and they eventually, working together with the rulers, with the Roman rulers, they work together for the crucifixion of Jesus. That's where we begin, you know, 30 A.D., 29, 30 A.D., with Jesus. We come into a world. This is essentially how the Bible reads. This is how Luke starts with the coming of John the Baptist. The kings, who were the kings? The kings were those who were meant to protect us. What do they end up doing in this chapter? They end up persecuting us. The priests were meant to pray for us. Guess what they ended up doing? Praying on us. That's what's going on, taking advantage of the people. This is a time of grave corruption. And so the gospel enters into a world where in the world everybody's working according to this sentence. You gotta take care of yourself, every man for himself. You gotta, you gotta save your life, don't worry. You know. And there's compromise everywhere. And into that world comes the word of God in John the Baptist. I hope that's good news to you. Because that's the world of the Bible, and that's the world in which we live, right? We constantly live in a world. What, what makes Christians struggle? A lot of our young people went to Grace Church yesterday and Friday night for the apologetics conference, and I'm glad you did, and apologetics is helpful in terms of talking about your faith, processing your faith, answering questions. But let me tell you something that I believe. I think apologetics are helpful. But I'll tell you this, almost uh, not almost always, but I would say frequently what happens to young people when they go off the rails with their faith. It's not because primarily they've come to a problem with science. It hasn't because they've come to a problem with philosophy. What has happened is they've come with a, to a problem with life. And suddenly, they, they live in a culture that seems incredibly unjust. Do we live in that culture? Isn't that what's going on right now? Everybody is looking at the culture, the economic culture, the political culture, the social structures, the cancel culture. They're going at it and they're looking under every stone to see where the rot is. Guess what we're going to find? It is absolutely everywhere. Because it's everywhere in the Old Testament and it's everywhere. So that's one of the difficulties is we come at it and we're looking at a corrupt and a broken world that's polluted and unjust and unfair. That's the world in which Jesus comes. But I'll tell you, there's a lot of people, it's not the world, it's the church. It's the priests. You know, in Canada, we have a long history, public history, where the church is known for sexually abusing children. That's what the church is known for. That's the reputation in the world, especially in the First Nations communities. It's, a, it's, a, a, it's an awful testimony. Young people look at the church. People go and experience. And here are the people that were supposed to pray for me, and they were praying on us, right? I'll tell you, that's a turning point. But it's in that world, it's in that environment we get the good news of the gospel. Jesus Christ is not that kind of king, and he is nothing like those priests. They pray on you, he lays down his life for us. Praise God. Praise God we got that kind of king. Praise God we got that kind of priest. And so John comes. So there are cruel kings and, and corrupt priests, and then there are impotent Prophets and insolent people, prophets who have no power. 
Isn't this <laughs> what John does? Look at verse three. It says, John comes, he goes into all the region around the Jordan, and what's he proclaiming? A baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That's good news. He's coming to announce a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, and simultaneously it says, Luke writes, this is written in the book, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, saying what? And people get ready because there's a train coming and picking up passengers from shore to shore. That's what he's saying. He is he's saying, repent and get ready. Because the Lord is about to show. This is a moment. You can feel in John the Baptist speaking, he's not joking. And I, I need to tell you, friends, he's coming. Today is the day of salvation. Get right with the Lord now. Don't put it off to tomorrow. And John is coming out preaching in fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 40. Comfort my people. Comfort my people. <laughs> Tell them the good news of the gospel. <laughs> I'm coming for them. I'm coming for them, but I'm coming to deal with sin. And I'm coming to bring righteousness. And I'm coming with a baptism of repentance. How does John sound in this text? I'll tell you how he sounds to me. Frustrated. You ever been frustrated trying to share the gospel? Why is he frustrated? Because he's got crowds coming to him and he's calling for a baptism of repentance, but they want a shallow, surfacy religious repentance, not a real repentance. Notice what it says in verse 7. It says, He said, therefore, to the crowds that came to be baptized by him, You look lovely today. Some of my favorite people are here. What did he say? You brood of vipers. You know that next week church was empty. No, next week he was in jail. What's going on here? Uh, John knows that there's a real repentance being brought by the Redeemer. Real repentance. Not fake repentance. Not so so let's, let's at least answer some questions about re what real repentance is, according to John. First of all, real repentance is more than escaping the wrath to come. Who told you to escape the wrath to come? Now, John knows in the prophecies that he's coming to proclaim that God is coming to bring redemption, but he's also coming to bring wrath. You, you either get right... Or are you going to get real with God? No joke. And there are some people who are coming to be baptized because they're, they're, they're getting their fire insurance. And he says, don't show up to carry on with your life and hope that by being baptized by me, you're going to get your fire insurance, that you're covering all your bases. Because what they're trying to do is escape their wrath. And John the Baptist says, I'm not here to help you escape your wrath. I'm here to help you escape the sin that's leading to wrath. He's calling them to what? Repentance. Do you want to be saved from the judgment of God, or do you want to be saved from your sin and self? That's right. And so repentance first of all, is not just escaping wrath. Secondly, true repentance is more than just a religious marker. Getting baptized is just not saying, okay, now I'm part of a club, and I can look back at that baptism and say, I got my bases covered. Notice what he says here. Bear fruits, verse 8, in keeping with repentance. Don't start saying to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able to raise from these stones children for Abraham. And even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. See what he's saying there? He's saying, you've got to get ready. You've got to get right. It's not a sign. You can't look back and say, oh, well, I got that covered. I got John's baptism. I'm good. No, we're not talking about doing an event that's a sign that you're good. 
we're talking about getting right with God. Really repenting. Getting saved from your sin. That's what repentance is. It's not a sign. It's serious. The third thing that we need to see in this text is true repentance isn't just theoretical. Oh, yeah, that's right. I agree with what it says. It's deeply personal. What John comes to do is he says you need to repent where you need to repent. Not the guy beside you. Not the woman that you came to church with. Not the guy that drives you crazy at work. You need to deal with you before God, right? So listen to what it says in verse 10. And the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share. So, by the way, these are the vipers <laughs> speaking. You brood of vipers. The crowd is coming and saying, okay, what? They're under conviction. He who has two tunics is to share with him who has none. Whoever has food is to do likewise. The tax collectors also come to be baptized. I love this. this Luke loves this. The tax collector and the sinner <laughs> and the Pharisee, sorry, show up later in the gospel. The tax collector comes and says, what am I to do? He knows he's a mess. And he says, collect no more than you're authorized to do. Yeah, they were working on behalf of the Roman Empire, collecting taxes for the Jews. They were despised for it. And he says to the tax collectors, you know what you guys are doing? You get a, you get a, a cut when you get taxes on behalf of the Roman Empire, but what are you doing? You're saying that you, the empire deserves more taxes and you're getting a larger cut, and the only thing that ought to be cut is your heart. You need to cut it out. You need to repent of this. And then it says, the soldiers in verse 14 asked him, uh, and we, what should we do? And he says, don't extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusations and be content with your wages. And those guys had power. And they had the authority. They could walk up and make you do whatever they want you to do. And they were using that to get their own will and their own way and profit against it. They were doing extortion. And John the Baptist says, you've got to cut it out because you're going to stand before the Lord. You see, see what's being said here? Repentance is real. Now, I'm just going to pause this morning and say, has the Lord been talking to you about your sin? Because that's where you've got to get real with God. Not everybody else has sin. Not the person that you know the story of. You in the mirror. You in the light. That's the sin you've got to deal with. People get ready. But here's the other thing that John teaches. True repentance is absolutely impossible it's humanly impossible now how do i know that look at what happens in this text of scripture it says in verse 15 as the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning john whether he might be the christ john answered them all saying i baptize you with water but he who is mightier than i is coming the strap of whose sandals i am not unworthy or not worthy to untie he will baptize you with the holy spirit and fire now i'm just going to stop there what is john saying here they're coming to him they know old testament prophecy they know he's fulfilling isaiah 40 they see him baptizing this happens in the gospel of john chapter one as well they go are you the christ and john goes oh, no i'm not the christ i'm not even close to the christ in that sense and he he says i baptize you with water which is a sign He's the only one that can change your heart. He's the only one that can do the heart surgery. And I, I like that line, I am not even worthy to untie his sandal. And in rabbinic teaching, you're, you're, in those days, you're, you, were, you always had an apprentice. You were always having someone you were taking along with you in, in life. And there was a, a principle amongst the rabbis with their disciples that your disciple could do all kinds of things for you as a rabbi in order to serve you. But one thing a disciple could not do is he could not tie your shoes, if you want to say that. He could not untie or tie up the strap of your sandals. Why? Because that was too humiliating. It was too low of a request. Do you hear what John's saying? You know what? None of you guys would let your disciples unstrap your shoe. I'm not even worthy to unstrap his shoe. 
You see, John, <laughs> he's aware of his brokenness, his weakness, his sin, in light of the holiness of the one who's coming. Now, I want to tell you something. He's calling them to repentance. He's warning them about, um, about, the, about standing before the Lord, this day of the Lord that's coming. But if, if you look down at, at verse 18, he, as he's exhorting them, I love this line. It says, so with many other exhor- exhor- exhortations, what did he do? He preached good news to them. So, so I, I want to tell you that part of the good news is to tell you you got to get right with God. There is no good news. The good news doesn't make sense unless you need someone to save you from your sins. And he says, I'm going to tell you, I can't do what he can do. I'm telling you, I am like every prophet down through the ages, like Jeremiah. They just threw me in a pit. They, they, they beat me up. They mocked me. They ridiculed me. And, and Jesus would come along, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How I belong that I might gather you like a hen gathers her chicks. Oh, Jerusalem, who kills her prophets. It's not a business thing. Jerusalem, who kills those who deliver the very word of God that would save their souls. And he goes, so so that's, that's what we have there. We have prophets are powerless, but then he says, but there's one greater. Isn't that good news? And what does he tell us about this one who is greater? I'm going to tell you three things he says here. This one is the only prophet who can actually make you repentant. He is the only one who can change your heart. Look at that text in Luke chapter 3 in verse 16. John answered, said, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, what's he going to do? He is going to baptize you with with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now they have heard these prophecies through the Old Testament. That's why in John's gospel, that's why here they come and say, are you the Christ? Because in the Old Testament prophecies, like Isaiah, one of the signs of the Messiah coming to do his work is that the Lord would come and he would pour water out in the wilderness like John's doing. Listen to Isaiah 44. But now here, this is verse one to five, but now hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you from the womb and will help you. Fear not. We've been singing that all morning, right? Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, uh, Jeshurun, who I have chosen, for I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. You see why they thought John the Baptist was the Lord coming, the Messiah, they were asking. He says, I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They shall spring up among the grass like the willows by flowing streams. They'll change, right? They'll grow, they'll be transformed. This one will say, I am the Lord and will call on the name of Jacob. The other will write on his hand, the Lord's. I have a friend whose tattoo is in Hebrew on his arm. It is, it is holy to the Lord. That's what he's saying. They'll write it down. I belong to him. I'm a child of God. And name himself by the name of Israel. Ezekiel chapter 36, 24 to 27. I will take you from the nations, gather you from the countries, bring you into the land. I will sprinkle clean water from you. I will cleanse you from your uncleanness. And from your idols, I will cleanse you. What will I do? I'll give you a new heart. I'll give you a new spirit. I'll put it within you. I'll remove your heart of stone from your flesh. I'll give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit in you and cause you to walk in my statutes. No prophet could have done that before Jesus. Jesus comes to give us the spirit and to change our hearts. What does it say at the end of the text? Not only will he baptize us with spirit, but with fire, And then the description is of the fire. His winnowing fork is in his hands to clear what? The threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff 
he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is an interesting text of Scripture because if you listen to the prophecies, one of the things that we're taught here is that when the Messiah comes, he will come with his winnowing fork. And the winnowing fork is he would take the grain and toss it up and he will separate the grain from the chaff. Now, what's being said in this text of Scripture in the prophecies is either you come to Jesus to the threshing floor and let him do that with your heart, separate the chaff from the grain and purify your heart and with the purifying fire of his holiness, or he will purify the weed and the chaff at the day of judgment. That's how the Scriptures read. The fire is either the fire of purification or ultimately, it is the fire of judgment. And so, here comes Jesus with the power to change hearts. Listen to Malachi. The end of the Bible co confronts the people of God, but it confronts the priests. The end of the Bible confronts the priests because of their corruption. What are they doing? They're doing a couple of things. One, they're engaging in idolatry as part of their ministry, and they are also divorcing their wives and abandoning their covenant promises to those that they love. Their family life, their religious life is a mess. Listen to what Malachi 3 reads. Behold, I will send my messenger. He'll prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts, but who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the priests, the sons of Levi. He will refine them like gold and silver. They will bring offerings of righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old as in former days for listen to this for I the Lord do not change therefore oh therefore you are O Israel are not consumed aren't you glad the Lord doesn't change I'm coming to deal with sin and there's two choices uh, you can get right with me or you can get ready for judgment that's what's going on that, and the good news is you can get ready you can get right. He can take you, and, and, the, and the threshing floor is the place where he deals with what's in your heart. We were talking in the office this week, the story of Ruth and Boaz, where they meet where? At the threshing floor. And it's at the threshing floor that we see Ruth's heart as she trusts in God and listens to Naomi's counsel, and she comes and offers herself to Boaz, and Boaz honors the Lord and reveals his heart, what's in his heart, because he not only takes and promises, pulls his garment, I have a friend who's a songwriter. He's got a song co called Cover Me. It's all about the song, uh, all about Ruth and Boaz. He covers her with his garment like Christ covers us with the garment of his righteousness. Isn't that good news? At the threshing floor. And he follows the standards and he's a righteous one. My dear friends, that's what's going on in this text. What's going on in this text is that this one is coming. This prophet is coming and he's coming to burn off the chaff of the hearts of his people through the power of the Holy Spirit. What you can't do, he can do. What I can't do, he can do. Now that's the prophet who can actually change people's hearts. Here's also in this text the priest who can also clean people's hearts, right? This is what he's able to do. This text where Jesus comes to be baptized is a significant text. And, I, and I'm going to summarize it for you, but I want you to notice four things in this text about Jesus' baptism. There's probably more you can get here. One, Jesus is baptized by John into the water. He comes up. Secondly, um, he is anointed by the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit comes down on him. And then I, the other thing that you might not have picked up on, which I pointed out earlier in verse 23, how old is he? When he's baptized, he's 30 years of age. And at the end of this text, which we did not read this morning in order to be merciful to you and Joel, 
We did not read the genealogy at the end, but this genealogy is not placed where you would expect it, and what's being said is remarkable because it traces the line of Jesus, not through the line of Aaron, but the lion, uh, the line, I was gonna say the lion, which is appropriate, the, the tribe of Judah. And at the end of this chapter, he is the son of Adam, and he is the son of God. Wow. Here's, here's what some theologians believe what's happening here, and I think it's true. Jesus is being set up here. He is being anointed as our great royal king priest. And so let me, let me explain to you, and I'm just going to do it quickly because because I want us to go to communion. In the Old Testament, in, in, in the book of the law, there were many washings that took place. Um, I was going to say there's a ton of washings, but we got washing tons, so maybe that's where that's what, no. <laughs> there, is, uh, there are washings that take place. Almost all of the washings in the Old Covenant law are self-washings. You had to wash yourself in order to be cleansed. You had to wash yourself in order to be prepared to return to the community, to return to worship. There was only a few times where you had somebody wash you. You know when it was? When Aaron washed his sons to consecrate them to be priests. The washing of the priests. So Leviticus 8, 6, Moses, sorry, Moses did this. Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. Then a few verses later, we are told in this passage of Scripture that Moses also, verse 12, Moses poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. The other thing that was true in the Old Testament is you could not start being a priest until you were how old? 30 years old. Oh, listen to Numbers 4. Moses and Aaron and the chiefs of the congregation listed the sons of the Kohathites by their clans and by their father's houses from 30 years to 50 years, everyone who could come on duty for service in the tent of meeting. You see, when it says in verse 23 that at 30 years of age, Jesus began his ministry, my dear friends, your great high priest has come. And he would go as our high priest. He embraces in obedience the calling of a God because as we see in scripture, he as our high priest offers up what? The sacrifice of himself. In other words, he goes and instead of us being threshed by the Lord for our sins, he goes to the threshing floor and he is threshed at the cross so that the chaff of our sins are put upon him and the beauty of his righteousness is put upon us. We get the grain of his righteousness. And the voice from heaven says what? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And the genealogy goes, and in, in the Old Testament, you could not be a priest unless you could actually trace your lineage to Aaron and Levi. So when they return in the book of Ezra to reestablish the priesthood in the temple, they go and they find out the genealogies. If you couldn't find your name, you couldn't serve in the temple. You had to prove that you were descended of the line of the priest. Well, what we have in this text of scripture is we have someone greater than the line of Aaron and Levi. We have the very eternal Son of God. Hebrews 4, 14 says, Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, who? The Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. We do not have a high priest who is not able to sympathize with our weakness. No cruel king, no corrupt priest, but we have one who is able to sympathize in every way, has been tempted as we are. Yet what? Without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. Isn't that good news? My dear friends, in Jesus Christ, we have been given our righteousness. He has taken our sin. We have been made righteous. And he has been made, this is my son, declared the eternal son, the God, the king over all. This is the announcement. Here is your king. 
in all of what he has and all that he is doing on our behalf to change our hearts, to take our sin, to give us his righteousness, to name us his own. Those are our names. Can I ask you a question? What was the story that defined your life when you walked in here this morning? And what's the story that's going to define your life now when you walk out? What I want you to do, what I pray you'll do, what I'm believing today, that if any of you walked out in your own righteousness or in, in a shallow religiosity, that you would walk, walk out today having had your heart dealt with, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, your heart <laughs> having been threshed here in the worship of the Word today, and you've come to Jesus and say, no, no, I am a child of God. Do you want that? That's my story. Even though I'm a John the Baptist, it can be your story. That's why we're here. And we need to go to tell the world who's got a whole bunch of stories about where their hope is and the world is without hope and we need to tell them there is a true fairy tale. The greatest story of all. Let's pray together. Oh God, we love you. Your word is rich and it's light. And we need to hear the theology of the priests and the kings and the prophets all consummated in the coming of Jesus Christ who can come and sift our hearts and take away the chaff and give us the righteousness, his own righteousness, so that we can stand before you holy and accepted. Thank you, Father, for your son. I pray, dear God, today that you would now powerfully in the spirit of God rewrite your put write your name on our hearts would you do that father would you call sinners to yourself and would you call them sons would you call them daughters would you say I'm well pleased because of Jesus help us oh God we pray through Jesus amen